just a quick background, you guys probably all heard. Um, I'm a consultant at J.S. Allen Hamilton, and I started off working before in grad school with C++ for financial engineering, and quickly moved into Python when I realized that that was just a waste of my time. <laughs> um, a thousand lines of code, four lines of code, which way do I go? Um, so I started working in Python and discovered pandas um, through a use case which I will um, not demo completely but basically show some of the elements of pandas that I think are really important um, into kind of driving to evangelize pandas and, and have more people use it. Um, so it was a use case where I basically had to take a lot of junk and make it very meaningful very, very quickly. Um, I had to do a two-week ETL on um, a bunch of data files for a large pharmaceutical company in, uh, in Spain. So a couple of you already know Panda, so I'll try to be as quick as possible, but I just wanted to um, set the stage by, I, mean, I don't want to get into a philosophical debate, but um, you know, there's big data, data science, um, technologists now they're calling, they're calling us at Booz Allen. Um, to me, I think big data has always been out there. I think NASA has had big data forever. Um, and I think at the end of the day, we're all scientists regardless of what it is. Um, and we're going by the scientific method all the time. Um, so everyone got really, really excited with machine learning and um, natural language processing <laughs> and all these fun buzzwords. But the ETL went to the pooper. Everyone was like, oh, who cares about the merging and the concatenating and the concatenating and the joining? Because everyone assumes that the data looks like that on the left side. I don't know what your experience is, but mine always looks like a junk pile of garbage. I get text, I get images, I get missing values, numeric columns swapped. I, I don't even want to go there. So it really is fun. If you look at pandas and you do ETL in pandas, it's just as fun as doing a covariance matrix or a TFID effector or getting precision accuracy and recall in, uh, in your machine learning algorithms. Um, so for the people who are, are new to pandas, um, I'm not going to read this word for word, but it's a great data analytics library. Uh, you can download it using the standard PyPy uh, method. Um, if you haven't used Pandas yet, I actually recommend going to um, Continuum IO's website. They have a Anaconda Python package that actually puts um, Pandas, NumPy, SciPy, the Python notebook, and the Spider editor all together. You download it for free. It comes up in one shot. It's very easy to use. Um, all right, so some of the nifty things of pandas. So, like I said earlier, it's in memory. It, it literally it reads any anything you want it to read, any file, CSV files, text files. Um, as I said earlier, uh, there are some new developments right now where um, we're taking web crawling data and just piping it directly into pandas and it turns it into a, a table, a columnar table. Um, the, intelligent, the intelligent data alignment and integrated handling of missing data. So um, I'll show a quick example later, but again, to find a null value sometimes across disparate data sets, it's really difficult. Here with pandas, you can just take five different various files, put them in one table, ask for a null value, and it'll find all the, the null values for you. Um, you can then in place do a lambda function and say, oh, by the way, for all those null values that have this period or this parentheses, replace it with this. Does it in one line in one shot. Um, very, very quickly. Right, so reshaping, reshaping and pivoting of data sets, this is also pretty amazing. So, you know, you have, let's say, for example, I had customer data, general sales data, address data, and uh, pharmaceutical data in all different kinds of tables. Um, I merged them all, and then I did a group by function, which in pandas is similar to a SQL group by function. Um, sliced out exactly what I wanted out of all those five tables, and then I did a group by I did a group by address. I did a group by pharmaceutical company. I did a group by um, customer name. All in the same. It, it pivots it all in the same space, all in the same line. And, and I'll show that as well. Um, versus being in Excel where I think, you know, you have to be on the... 
Listen, it's our only other pivot table method. It works well. You know, if you have tax data and numeric data in Excel and you're trying to do a pivot table, it's just going to look at you like it's just going to it's going to look at you like you're crazy. This will just do whatever you want it to do, um, regardless of what kind of data it is. And then, uh, oh, there you go. Columns can be inserted and deleted from data structures, data structures, etc. Um, high performance merging and joining of data sets and hierarchical axes indexing. Um, yeah, that's also pretty amazing. You can, you know, you have, I don't know, 100 columns and your date column is the 98th column and you're like, well shoot, I want to index it by date and then sort by that. Okay, then you tell Pandas, by the way, column 98 is now my new index and I want to sort it by time and date. And I want to only have January from 2013. That's also one inline lambda function in Pandas. And your, again, so your time series functionality. Um, this is pretty phenomenal for pandas because they also have domain specific time functionalities. So if you're in finance um, and you want to do, you know, your trading days are not the same as your normal calendar year, you can actually take a data set that's over 365 days and say, I want to apply the business year to this data set. It'll automatically apply the trading year to it. Um, and reshape it for that uh, amount. If it's by days and you want to reshape it to the month, it will reshape it to the month by whatever calculation you want, sum, mean, and average difference, etc. It'll do all that reshaping for you. And I, I think I have an example of that. All right. So yeah, quickly, this is um, what I what I'll show is I basically had to determine metric for sales data for a company client using a common mapping. Um, the data was in numerous files with different file names, which had no headers, by the way. <laughs> no headers. Yes, different languages, no headers. Another fancy thing about Pandas is when you read in your file, if you give it a names dictionary and list, it automatically assumes you have no header, and it will apply all those names to each column and you have a header in the table right away. Um, also, if you have a column that has a date format and you want it to say, you know, your regular um, Python date, you know, date series, you can say, oh, by the way, now that you've also labeled all my columns, I want to make sure that you know column five is a date column. And it'll automatically transform, let's say you have like 05, 2010, it'll know that column is a date. And it'll turn it, and you can index by date, so then it becomes a, a chronological indexing system. Um, versus just looking at it with some numbers. Um, it also accepts European dates, so if you have it in reverse order, it understands that as well. Um, yeah, I had some fun experiences with that one. Let's see what else. Yeah, so another thing I liked about this is if you guys, I mean, I worked in SQL for a long time too, I can't repurpose my SQL queries. They're domain specific. I mean, I can, but, you know, I still kind of have to tweak it. I have a different database I'm working in. With Python, I just remembered all, I just had all my scripts and just changed all the parameters. I just kept changing parameters and I applied any data sets, I added different tables, and I just applied it to different clients all the time. So I now had these scripts that, you know, maybe they took me a few days to get going, but then I was just kind of spitting out analytics, you know, in, in a matter of hours. Right, so a little interjection. I got so frustrated, I actually wrote a Dr. Seuss rhyme one day when I was going through what the hell I had in my files. So, that's that. <laughs> All right. So, I'm assuming everyone can see that, right? No? <laughs> I can see the light. Let's see if I can get it to... Uh... All right, let's see. Let's make this. Oh my god, the little spinning wheel of death. Start with one of the simpler 
Um, I'm obviously not, I want to leave more time for q and I'm on, you know, not going to go through code and demos, we're all Pythoners here, but um, another very cool thing Pandas has, if you guys haven't used it yet um, and want to play around right away without any data, it has something called pandas.io.data, um, which uh, is a bunch of public data sets, which you can literally just say, implement as, you know, import it as web, and then get data Yahoo literally means go to Yahoo Finance and pull whatever data I want for whatever time I want. Um, and there is, I think right now, like four financial companies and weather data and something else on there um, that you can pull from. So this is just a really good example of how quickly you can go in and, you know, this one liner pulls all your data in there. Then you build your data frame, which is like building a table, and you say, all right, I want one column to have the adjusted close information, which is your adjusted close column in the financial data, your volume column, um, and you know, over, over that entire column, go ahead and, and, and pull it in there. Um, I want you to run a percentage change, change calculation on all of that and call it returns. Um, so another really cool thing about working with pandas in the notebook is that, which obviously is harder in SQL, it takes a lot longer, um, or other analytics libraries, you want to know that you did the transformations correctly. You want to know that you're not missing all values. You want to know that your numbers look okay. So you can immediately go in here and say, what, is my, what does it look like? Um, this gives you, the, obviously, fit at the end of it. You can do head, you can slice, you can say, give me rows 15 to 16, give me only Microsoft, only Google, only these dates, to make sure that your, um, your data looks good before you give it to your client or to your boss or whoever you're giving it to. Um, so here you're actually running a covariance with Microsoft and IBM in one line. And you can do it for the entire table. And again, you get your information to see if, you know, when you're doing a covariance with different stocks or whatever other numerical data you're using, if it makes sense or not to you. And so, I mean, just to, we're, we're, right now we're working on doing um, intraday uh, variance at risk calculations for, fi for financial firms. So um, this is just a, uh, a variance matrix. We're taking a randomization of all of the stock data by doing random permutations in pandas and going ahead and doing the variance on that and getting it right away. So this is a lot easier for me to do than it is in C++. Um, and because pandas integrates so nicely with NumPy, this makes it very easy to implement all of those um, calculations and matrix vector calculations that we do. So this, anyone can literally, I mean, you could just go to pythonpandas.org or something like that, and you can literally go ahead and play around with all this web data. Um, and an example of what I like I was like literally going in and I had to do this. so like I told you earlier I had no headers plugged it in I had one common situation I basically had a zip code I had to find out from one zip code everything that was going on for this pharmaceutical company across um, across one country and I had to link it all using one zip code. And I had to then roll up and drill down by country, region, and province in about a week. Um, and of course, none of the, this, there were no values in the zip code and mismatched zip codes and text in the zip code because there was actually a different country in their data. How big is the data set? Well, so it wasn't one data set. It was about 150 different Excel and SQL files. Excel, SQL files, and SQL, um, text files, web log files. Could you join them all? In the yes. Menu? That's the beauty of Pandas, is if you see here, I have a text file up here. Um, I have a CSV file um, lower down. But it will take, when you say read table, so it has a bunch of I.O. functions, read CSV, um, read text, 
read uh, HTML5. Read table is kind of like, I'm just going to give you something, put it into a table. And it does what it can. Sometimes it looks a little funny. <laughs> uh, if you give it very, um, I forgot what I gave it once. I think I gave it like a random array of stuff and it just gave me one big column. Um, so, yeah, you can read anything. No, into uh, what my point was, okay, was uh, is, uh, what happens when it doesn't all fit in your memory? So, how does it, yeah. I haven't, I, mature? so I, the only time I ran into memory issues was when I was in the notebook. But when I was doing it at the script level, I didn't run into any memory issues. Um, my, f I have someone who did and basically um, implemented Cyphon and started applying more definitions to the functions and got a speed, I think it went like 10 times faster when he did Cyphon. Um, and there's a really good, I'll put a link, I'll put a link on Meetup, there's a really good implementation of Pandas and Cyphon, which will make, uh, it'll make it go 10 times faster. So um, I'll, sh I'll, I'll shoot that link up. I didn't have any, I didn't run into any memory issues, so I can't, I don't have the answer for that, sorry. Um, right. So, let me just go down a little Right, so like things like this. So it won't, it, it won't neglect any data. It won't not come in because it has funny things like that. It'll just show you what's happening. That's not pandas, that, that was actually in there. Oh, and then another way to deal with um, memory is, for example, if you're reading in a file and you only need two of the columns, tell pandas you only need two of the columns. And it'll take those in and throw the rest out. It'll load, uh, clear, clean out that gar uh, garbage collection on the rest of it. Once you tell it, you know, this new, this new data set is only going to be these different columns here, it'll toss out the rest. Oh. That's how desperate I was getting. This was a this was a hairy project, yeah. Um, and I think Your fingers crossed. Yeah. So <laughs> here's another really good example of why I love this system. Um, I needed province code. I said, Hey, I got everything by zip code. They're like, We don't want it by zip code anymore. Awesome. What do you want it by now? And I mean, a lot of us in data analytics and in data science know that this happens. The client, the customer says, I changed my mind. Um, I actually want province codes. But don't worry about it because the province code is actually the first two numbers. And I'm like, that's not as easy as you think because not all the numbers are the same. Your zip codes are strings. Came pandas. So I basically went in. And I said, I did a mapping. So I had a province code that had my two digits. And sure enough, they didn't all work because there was some byte array or some number in front of here that was not bringing these up as actual zip codes so they wouldn't map to the province code correctly. So I had a bunch of null values when I did the merge. So I easily with pandas, I did the merge and the merge said, if you don't have an equal number of columns merged together, you have this other, it spits out another column like a concatenated key in SQL. It just takes two keys, puts them together, and it's like, there's that stuff that we couldn't merge together. Um, so I looked at that and I said, perfect. So for all that stuff, I'm going to go in and say, this one that didn't work, give it that number. This one that didn't work, give it that number. That, it took me half a second. There goes my data, clean. Yeah. Is that the first one? Does that follow the same pattern as the others? Is that the other? others are like the fourth and fifth most significant? Uh, you mean like the, the third one? You mean like the province codes here? Yeah, why isn't the first one 7,000 matched to 7? Because 700 is another country. So that was another fun part of my project. All the zip codes were five digits minus that one. So I don't know if I have it here, but this was a nice thing about pandas is that, um, yes, here it is. Okay, so it said, wait a minute. I looked at null values, I got numeric numbers, and then I looked again, I merged, and it said, nope, still not working. Still missing something. So I said, okay, where are my null values? I was getting something like that, AD. AD is that 700 number you're looking at. That was a different country. 
So what I did was I gave it a false province code, and then I told the client that they were reporting sales in another country. That made them excited. Uh, so right, so another here you go right here is a okay. So in a few lines, you can index by date and time, which um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with NumPy, but your nanoseconds here and your date time 64 will basically take you know whatever your column is with that date format and um, give it that index so that you can chronologically sort by it. Um, and then I went ahead and gave it the I gave it the um, string year 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 month month so it would um, it would automatically map to whatever 2005 05 whatever. Um, then of course they were like no we want it by month and we want it to we want the you know the edges to be towards the end of the month not the beginning of the month so I just resampled it by MS in pandas. So pandas has. 30 different reshaping functions for calendar uh, for the calendar year. Month, day, month end, month beginning, business year, business quarter, you name your, your poison, it has it. Um, and then I did, I also did a group by function so that I could group everything by the month and then slice it out at that point. Uh, again, I did that in like half a second. And the two CSV here, you can spit it out to anything. You can bring it back out to SQL. You could take it out to a text file. You could uh, connect it to um, MongoDB now. You can also connect it to um, uh, Couchbase. And they're coming up with another, a couple of other connectors um, as we speak. All right, I will not bore you with the rest. Needless to say, it can do a lot of stuff. All right, so that's what I was telling you about Siphon. So um, yeah, it'll be 10 times faster because uh, pandas will convert everything into a series where when you do it at the Siphon level, you'll use NumPy and it'll use arrays. It'll be a lot quicker that way. Um, and these are the things that they are planning on doing in the future. Um, I'm pretty excited for the HDF5 integration. Um, and then one thing I'm working on is getting the commit to work with um, Scrapey, two pandas with NLTK, all in one pipeline. Um, and there's also, if anyone's interested, I think I have it in here. Yeah. Someone mentioned GIS, so they do have a Geo Pandas. Um, it is connected with SKLearn. I've used it for some random forest regressions as well. It makes feature selection a lot easier. Um, and the, that's the, the last link, which I'll, I'll put all this on meetup. The last link is for that web I.O. if you want to just pull in a bunch of finance data or weather data or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And that is what I have. You guys have questions or comments? I know you, uh, some other people have used Pandas before, so I'm more than happy to hear if you guys have questions about stuff that you have with it. Yeah. One thing that confused me is like when I started using Pandas was it would make indexes when you were sorting or doing different functions. And then I felt like I really wanted to do reset index, like maybe too much. When did you do reset index? You know, when you need to, when, I don't know, I was just like, I, I feel like I just want regular columns. I was more familiar with R, where right. a column is a column is a column. And so, could you repeat the question? Uh, could you repeat the question? Uh, yeah. So, um, right, you were, so you use reset index in pandas a lot because let's say you want to index by date and time, and then you say, well, now I want my data to be in its regular format again. So you've reset, you reset the index so it goes back to its original data frame. Is that what you were doing a lot? Uh, yeah, yeah, so that I could, I don't know, maybe I felt like it was easier to do a merge with the data frame that had been reset. Um, hmm. So I'm thinking, because I would reset it only because it would, um, so if I did a group by function, it creates a dual index, right? So it'll do like a, it'll do a date index and then it'll group it by number of products, for example. So I would reset the index because I couldn't, I just wanted it to go by date. Um, and so I would reset it. So I'm not sure, 
what you were what were you resetting it for exactly? I felt like I was trying to turn an index into a column, you know. So. Oh. Right. You could. Um, so if you were to actually turn the index into a column, if you were to just redo the. So if you were to say make a as index as type and then make the next column that index, you wouldn't have to reset anything. You could just you could just change that other column that you want to sort by and make that the index. So would you say again like on the index do as type? Yeah. Okay. So you could do um, you could do make this column as type and then change the type. Or you can do um, dot I think it's set set index and then the column. Um, which is a little easier than resetting the index, which kind of throws out your data frame again. Right, it kind um, of redoes the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. And with the group by function, that's also kind of frustrating because, you, you know, it spits it out, and then it, if you have a date time, if you have a if you have an array that's that's a date time nanosecond function or something, and you do the reset index, it spit, it takes that back out and turns it into a float like a regular. I thought when you do the set index, it throws out your that index column. Like if you say set index to another column, you lose your index. Don't you? Doesn't that happen? Well, you 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 use a different index. You don't lose it if you set it. You lose it if you reset it. But if you do set index, like if you have a, a second column and say set index, that column becomes the index, and then whatever was your index is just it doesn't just go away. It's, I thought it's, 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 yeah. It's, I I was having that problem. I thought. Really? Because for me, it goes back into the table. Yeah, have you done the new pandas? I was, yeah, I haven't done that for a while. Okay. I've always been resetting the index and then doing what you do. Okay. Yeah, maybe I'll, um, I'm, I'm clearing my, um, I'm going to post my stuff on Git. I'm, I'm getting rid of all the client information on it. Um, and then I'm, but I, I did a bunch of set indexing. Yeah, so I'll give you guys my Git account. Yeah. Um, so I, I do a lot of stuff with uh, database backend as well. And um, I, 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 get a, I don't know how current the versions of pandas I'm using are, but um, the experience that I've had is that the, like some of the more complex queries or the more uh, database specific functionality is not available through pandas directly. And so I've gone to SQL Alchemy or something like that and then tied them together. Um, can you talk about experience with like integrating with various databases and that sort of stuff? Yeah, so I have yet to integrate with SQL. Um, I found that I got really good performance with the group bys, uh, with the group by function. Um, between group by and reshaping, I felt like that gave me a good um, complicated SQL query. But what were you running into? Where you, like, what well, was so, your threshold? Where you were like, well, so I mean, so some of this stuff that I'm looking at is uh, just operational, like looking at. Uh, Logging activity logging in, in the database for for websites and things. So we have these tables with you know 40 million rows, and so you can't pull the whole table into memory. Right. And so um, I would be pulling some subset of the table or pulling uh, some aggregate of the table uh, as it was. And so in, in some cases that involves a whole bunch of joins and some kind of table expressions and some other kinds of things for the base query to get the data that I want to go analyze into the thing. Um, and so I would, you know, I would build that first and pull that in. And so I ended up, for some of those things, having to do that. Uh, we doing the joins my, and the merges yeah, in. To, to, um, to build out the data set that I wanted to pull in to pandas, I would do that with something like SQL Alchemy. Right. And then I would take that uh, data and pipe it into a pandas data frame and then do some analysis. So, okay, and you, you uh, weren't so yeah. I mean, I've done a lot of the, the joining and merging on on pandas itself. Okay. Um, and that's been that's been pretty. I mean, that's been pretty simple. Um, concatenating also just. Yeah, I mean, my my experience has been that if I pull in all the data I need from each one of these tables, um, either I run out of memory, or the sequence of queries to get all that stuff in there takes like forty minutes. Right. And, and I might as well just it's do more it in the data. data that's the yeah. problem, not the problem. Yeah, I mean, Once so, you get it, it's okay. So it, it yeah. makes more sense for me to just do the query in the database, get the thing that I want to analyze out. Right. But I found that I couldn't do that through the, yeah, the interface with pandas. And even when you did it at the script level, like not using like a notebook or something, like, did you do it like using an editor? Like just... um, 
Well, yeah. So I, I mean, I didn't try like just doing command line execute from right. Python to run a script against the database. No, I didn't try doing that. But um, no, because I was trying to go through, I guess, pandas uh, sort of interface to SQL, um, which seemed. I guess it was. I don't know if it was using JDBC or. or I think that's what it's whatever. using right now, and, and I it know that. It just seemed. Yeah. It seemed like the, not all the functionality was there. So yeah. are you so using like a connector where you run the query from? Yeah. And I, I've had, I mean, we've done that all, but like once I've got the query done, I'm doing it straight out of I mean, This Python. was a while back, so it makes Yeah, doing it straight out of Python. Like if you have all those joins and everything, that's fine. Once you get all that in your query and then run it out of Python, I've had no problems with that. I've had the same, I had the same problems, like try to pull everything in and then try to do it, then you realize that. Again, like, it's going to go bust. Yeah. When I asked my database expert, it's like, I need all this data, give me a query, and he just, well, I built the queries myself. Yeah, I mean, I've used like a Cumulo and stuff for like bigger, you know, to pull the data out and then put it in pandas. Yeah. Hive. I work for the government. We have DB2. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, that's, that's so good. Cool. Yeah. I, mean, I guess it's one of the things about Panda. I mean, it's memory. You know, if you're doing in-memory yeah. stuff like this, it will go kaboom if you do like 40,000? 40, 40, 40 million. 40 million yeah. rows. Yeah. 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 Spark. She have not enough Spark talk yet. <laughs> Spark is the way to go for that. I mean, DB2 handles it well. It does, yeah. I, I just have to do stuff in the day, but you can't, yeah. can't try to pull it out. I also like it for things like before I go and spend my time in DB2 to run the query, like slicing out pieces of it to make sure that the analytic is going to make sense. Business sense is really good. Pandas is good for that as well. Um, before spending my time in doing, you know, five joins and then realizing right. that yeah. it and actually, make sense. I, I did a lot of that yeah. where I pull out, like, you know, the first. 50 rows of whatever in the first 20 rows of this one. Right. Kind of Does it make sense? All right, let me, you know, um, and I use that for a lot. I mean, at the end of the day, I still end up having to go back and say, okay, I run and run like a Monte Carlo simulation. Does it look pretty in pandas? Now I have to go do it in C++. Yeah. So there are times where I do have to go the I now. Yeah. It's the faster than ever goes I mean, one, one way that I've gotten around this in some cases is if you have a library that supports um, calling functions in the database, you can actually encapsulate your query into a function of some sort right. that takes parameters. Right. And then you can do whatever slicing and dicing you want via the parameters and you sort of if you build out the function in the database, then you just do a simple select on that function. And plug in the parameters, yeah, which yeah. is kind of what so. I was saying with Pandas. That's a good I'm a novice, so this is an open-ended question, but would Scrappy be a good tool if I wanted to harvest a results of a whole bunch of queries put into a Google search engine? There's a database of queries, and then just to, to run through and get the results to get, say, a certain type of business in a radius of a certain geography of each city or your zip code entry. That'd be a good tool to use for that, or is that my fault? I, so my initial reaction is to say yes, um, I don't want to say yes 100% because I don't have like, that data set in front of me, but um, if I had that business question in front of me, I would give it a shot in Canvas first. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think that would work. Because right, right now there have been other tools I've tried and they've been insufficient or they generate stuff that's not. What have you tried? Off the shelf. It's nothing here. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so, for your data set, you have uh, you have like a table, and one of the one of the columns in that table is like HTML that you pull off the web. Is that a, a, a database of USPS cities in the US, cities, towns, neighborhoods. In other words, a, a list of all the town cities, and then to do a geographic query um, for a certain yeah. business yeah. category. So right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I would even, I was going to say go with the geo, the geo pandas route, but that's, I think, a more low, that's kind of GIS. Yeah, and, but I mean, you, might, you probably want to use some additional tools with that. So you want to have, like, pandas, but then also use, like, Scrapey or Beautiful Soup or one of these things to do that. Off the, the, off the, the parsing off right, of That's why I'm asking about Scrapey. Oh, Scrapey, oh, that's yeah. Oh, okay, so I, I wasn't sure if you already had, thank you, I wasn't sure if you already had the data off the web or if you wanted it off the web. In that case, yes, yeah, Scrapey will do it very quickly. Um, I love Scrapey. 
Uh, and it depends on what, so you're saying just from like Google? Um, and what kind of websites would you use? Like where are you grabbing the data from? Like, just their, what they have, what they show is their commercially, you know, their, their geo business location in, in their own area. Okay, so yeah, what, I mean, what, I mean, just kind of overall what you could do is just, you know, um, find out what the HTML tag is for that information on the web and use Scrapey to grab that data and then you create a pipeline in Scrapey that says I want to put that in a CSV file and write it to these rows and then you use Pandas to read in those rows and do your analytics. Um, and so right now that's not an, that's not a pipeline in, in uh, Pandas or Python, that's what we're trying to build out right now. You have to do it separately. So you have to use Scrapey, um, do the pipeline um, into a CSV file and then read that into Pandas separately. We're trying to make it all one shot so that you can just run one script and yeah, we're trying to get that to work, so it's a nice side job. <laughs> mm -hmm. The uh, missing values type <laughs> and not the numpy not a number type, um, I found it like kind of hard to work with sometimes. Like is there a way when you read in to like if you encounter something that Pandas thinks is like a missing value, just like put empty string or just something else in there? Yeah, so there is a thought, I I'll I'll send you the link. If there is a um there's a syntax in when you read the table mm -hmm. that says um, null equals, and then in parentheses, you put whatever you want it to say. Oh. What, yeah. yeah. And it'll, like, you could say put missing, put zero, put ABC, put question mark, and it'll do that um, for all the values that it doesn't understand or can't read it. So what was your experience like when you started using this stuff? <laughs> did you have a Python background, or did you just go at it? Did you learn learn it um, off of the web or tutorials or did you read the pandas book? That sort of thing. How yeah. did you get started with this? Um, so I kind of had your, I did DB2 in school, C++, um, and that stuff is just going way too slow for me. So I Google searched everything. Um, I had started working in pandas, um, I mean started working in Python. I liked it. Um, I had been kind of like a year into it, uh, and I basically live by the O'Reilly website, <laughs> like everyone does. <laughs> they make so much money. Um, and I found the, uh, I think it's Wes McKinley, who right now is the um, author of Pandas and wrote the book. And I went by that and I said, all I saw was financial calculations and maps and merges in like seconds, and I was like, I'm giving this a go. Um, and from there on, I just used the, night, the, the notebook to test out and make sure that things were running properly. That was the easiest way to self-teach um, on, on what was going on. And what else did I use? And the documentation. I mean, I would say go the O'Reilly book if you're new to Python. Go the documentation if you're not new to Python. Because the documentation is, all, is very, it has very, very good documentation. I mean, I think, I don't know how else is, I don't know what you guys think about it, but yeah, I mean, so for, it's very good. I guess for a different perspective, like I, um, I had been programming Python for a while, and when NumPy first came out, I started doing some NumPy uh, like 2005 or 2006. I don't, I don't know when that was, but um, so, but so the the IPython notebook thing wasn't around then, and so. Like I trained myself writing scripts, which like when that notebook came out, so it's so much easier to do stuff. So if you're doing it now, don't do anything until you go get a Python notebook. Yeah. It makes it so much easier to, to test ideas and stuff. Yeah. Um, Anaconda really is like amazing. Oh, so you okay? Yeah. Thank you for uh, for uh, you know. Yeah, Python. Uh, it's it's incredible really that phenomenal. I can't believe it's. I have to say I can't believe it's free. Um, it's, Good business. Yeah, um, I've been in my wisdom I've been trying to teach myself R. So, the comparison between R and Pandas. Anybody done both? Yeah. And it was the maturity of Pandas compared to R. R. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've, I've done R. I mean, have you done it more than I? I mean, you can go ahead and. Um, I would probably venture to say that R is a bit more mature, but uh, Python is trying to catch up fast. Uh, Python started, uh, Pandas, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, 
started with the financial impetus. Yes. And so everything was pretty heavily oriented toward what they needed was the first thing they put in. And uh, R was a, has a slightly different twist to it. So it's probably more mature, but it's also slower. There is a uh, data table. Ta data table package. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. that will make it a little faster. But um, yeah. um, I, I mean, I, I think the other thing is that R R comes from S and S plus, right? So when when R was created, like they kind of they kind of had a full language baseline to start from to say, hey, how much of this have we implemented? Um, and and you know, the, I think the Pandas library is taking on a smaller piece of that, and there are other Python libraries that take on other pieces of that, and so it's it's not just Pandas, it's it's the whole ecosystem. Yeah, that's the thing about it, they, they sort of have a significant number of plugins, once you can look at the dependence, they discover yeah. some rather interesting. Um, okay, so yeah, because I would prefer a Python type uh, tool. Yeah, I mean, I think. Otherwise, that's very, very you can do a lot. Work. You can do a lot with the current Python tool set. Yeah. Um, some of it may require a little more coding than, than you have to do in R, but, mm -hmm. um, but it's catching up fast. And the Python is generally faster. Mm -hmm. There's also a library of ways of playing with R and R. So if you come from R background, you can actually go mm -hmm. and to R. <laughs> and I, I think even Pandas has an R connector now. Yeah, yeah. If you look at the documentation, there's an R connector for Pandas, um, and they're working on making that one even better. Um, and ggplot as well. Yeah. Oh, sorry? Yeah, because right now it's just an app log, which is. Yeah, is this a two point seven or three? You uh, for Pandas? Yes. You can use either. Cool. I'd recommend two point seven. I'm not a big fan. <laughs> Someday they're going to turn off 2.7 and everybody's going to scream. <laughs> why don't you like 2.7? No, no, I like 2.7. I mean, why don't you like 3? I, I, I run out of memory, I glitch out on stuff, I don't know, like, I just things break when I do the, what I do in 2.7. Scrapey doesn't work in 3. Scrapey doesn't work in 3. I don't know, I don't know that. Oh, you try, I... No, because they start staking, doesn't it? There you go. That's how I'm never leaving Scrape Beef, so. Is there any part of Panorama LTK part tonight? So that would be a different talk. So that you might talk about it was maybe. Yeah. So when will you give the different talk again? Whenever I'm invited to. I'm currently. We'll arrange that. Yeah. I'm presenting the paper in Atlanta in June. So I guess after I present the paper. Um, hopefully, they'll, some video game company will want me to wrap it up and ship it off. So that'll be interesting. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's more about trying to um, save them a lot of money because I mean I'm not sure who else is a gamer here, but a lot of people who watch movies, you have a movie that comes out and there's a commercial and there's an actor in it, and you're like, why did they why did they film that actor? They, I'm not watching that movie just because it's that guy or because it's that girl. If you have a video game and you have a forum and you have a uh, data that says, I don't want that gun to be blue, your developer, before the final game comes out, can actually change the color of that gun. Um, and so that, that piece of time where you can gather that data and understand it and then present it to the developer to change it and then tell your customer we're listening to your forums on the spot and responding is probably going to increase your sales. So I'm working on that. Since there is interest, we can schedule it, definitely. Yeah. It's not a problem. Cool. Um, and yeah, scraping, uh, scraping has getting has been getting a lot of a lot of attention right now, especially with deep um, foreign scraping. But I would be um, if anyone is trying it out, just be very careful to state that you're scraping. And if there's robots, uh, which are these little gray things in the Firefox tab that says "Do not scrape," don't don't scrape. <laughs> Like we'll get a nice 404 error later. What? Is that robots.txt? Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you like, look in the HTML file, it has like a little robots thing. It's there. It's a gray line. It basically means don't scrape that website. Yeah. Behave yourself. Behave yourself. Yes. I did it on Yelp.com because I wanted to prove in grad school that they were plugging in reviews falsely, and. Uh, yeah, I can't use Yelp.com anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, but 
that later on. They admitted that they were doing that. So. Yeah, um, just to whet our appetites, perhaps, could you say a few words maybe on, on how scrapey is better or different from, for example, like W getting a bunch of stuff and then working with it? So, um, I don't know if I have anything up here. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't believe anybody mentioned it, but is there like a comparison with a beautiful suit? Or is it a to me? So, I. Um, I haven't played around with Beautiful Soup. I know some people who were using it before they were using Scrapey and then started using Scrapey. Um, I'm not sure. With, so with Beautiful Soup, can you actually create pipelines to then, like let's say you're crawling, I don't know, five different forums and you want all of that forum data, you want five spiders to go out, scrape all that forum data, um, bring it back together and put it in a CSV file. Can you do that all in Beautiful Soup? No. Okay, so you can do that all in one Scrapey script. The, so Scrapey and Beautiful Soup aren't really com comparable. Scrapey uses a um, XPath parser. And um, also XML. And XML. Yes. And you can actually, so it's using a particular parser to find stuff within mm -hmm. the text. Beautiful Soup is another parser that you can plug into the Scrapey framework. So just like with Django, you wouldn't say that Django is comparable to, I don't know, mustache templates. Oh. Uh, it's more that Django has a templating language, and in fact, Scrapey has a pluggable um, parser. And so you can actually use Beautiful Soup as the parser within Scrapey if you want to. Historically, too, I don't know what the case is now because it's been a while. Um, Beautiful Soup used to be the best parser for parsing nasty, poorly written HTML documents. HTML that didn't conform to anything, yes. that was a mess, that had all kinds of malformed things. Whereas if you put it in through something like LXML or whatever it is that you're doing running uh, precise XPaths on, those will choke if, you're, uh, if your input is malformed. Yeah. So, eight, so Beautiful Soup used to be, and I probably still is to some degree, although, you know, when people talk about it that much, there's, they've probably listened and are trying to uh, fix things in other products, but it used to be the way that you uh, mess with poorly written HTML. Um, yeah, so I, I don't have this up anymore, but um, a few other things I've been uh, doing in Scrapey is, for example, we've been trying to um, predict pitches from Major League Baseball. So you can connect Scrapey to the MLB API, and then it's so I find, you know, when your HTML is bad, maybe Beautiful Soup is good for that. I find Scrapey is really good when you have XML mixed in with HTML, mixed in with CSS, and it links a different way, and then you might have a static link, but then instead of a static link, you might have some other href that you need to follow into an X path that then needs some kind of regex descriptor that you have to plug all together to say, go to that file. So some kind of very deep forum crawling. Um, so, for example, the uh, I used for the video games I used forums.xbox.com, and I had to go into each I had to go into each review, but then I had to paginate over all the reviews, and then even within each review, I had, each forum I had to go into each forum and pull each review and pull each timestamp. So, what you can do with Scrapey is you can say find this like anchor page, and then take the regex of this anchor page match that regex, but simply um, give me a counter for the pages. Iterate over all those pages, and then scrape all of these HTML tags for me. Oh, and if there's some XML in there, also scrape this XML for me. Put that all in a CSV file, and map this item, which would be maybe the content, this item is the date, this item is the person's name, this item is how many stars they have, whatever. Map that all into one CSV file, and give me that, and you'll That'll happen in a matter of uh, minutes, seconds or minutes, depending on how long or how much data you have. So this was 175 pages of reviews. So it took about two minutes? Yep. Yeah, this, I know it's not good when you can crawl stuff that fast. Um, but or, they let or it's you. very good. <laughs> <laughs> but they let you. Um, so it's, it's, very, it's very good for that. Um, and if you want to get started, um, I could probably do a tutorial too. Um, 
Firefly, uh, Firebug, if you guys know, is the HTML revealer, the CSS revealer. I mean, you can literally just take that, H that X path and copy it into Scrapey and, and see what's going on. Um, I don't know if Beautiful Soup has, probably not, but Scrapey at the command line has a shell where you can go in and look at the raw HTML of whatever website you're looking at and test out the XPath selectors to see if that's the data you actually want to get before you go in and crawl 150 pages of data. Um, so it's, it's uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Can go you on. like step through, like, uh, like sort of debug the, yep. the path that you do? Yep. So there are times sure. where, yeah, there are times where like, you know, the the href is bad, or I'm missing a parenthesis, or I tabbed wrong. God, I love Python. Um, and so, it, it, you're, if you just run the scrapey script, it'll just spit out. It'll say, yeah, I tried to do it, tried to scrape, nothing happened, but it won't give you a good error unless you have logging, and then you have to go into the logs. So if you just use a scrapey shell, if it's not working, it'll just give you, it'll give you an empty dict. It'll give you like an empty was, and it'll say, I couldn't scrape anything. So you could go in and, and step back and, and see what's wrong. It's also really cool when you're at Starbucks and it's just stuff that's just crawling. People want to know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just rolling down your command line and you're like, doo, 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 doo. it's like just streaming down and you're like, yep, I'm not doing anything wrong. No. <laughs> but it's just all, it's all okay. It's all okay. I'm doing it on websites I'm allowed to do it on. So it's cool. It's cool. cool. What's your biggest complaint about pandas? or the biggest pitfall that you run into if you don't have a major complaint about it? Memory. Same, same, yeah, same with you. And I kind of feel like that's almost like my overall Python issue. It's just memory. Um, I, like, I, I would, if I saw something more than 10,000 rows, I'd, I'd automatically know, okay, I'll use Pandas to test out an analytic, but I'm not going to use it to do full force um, joining or merging. It'll probably just blow up. But yeah, I have that problem overall with Python. Um, I'm looking at the but other. SQL is great for that. Yeah, SQL is good for that. Um, well, and MongoDB, no SQL. Document based structures. It's another talk. That's fun too. Yeah, I've done some Mongo too. Mongo's pretty good. Um, it's pretty fast, but it has its issues too. And then if you want to buy Pivotal, it's got Hawk, which is how deep in SQL. I don't want to buy anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't want to either. So. Mongo or Postgres? Right? Postgres has document objects now, so you can mix your yeah. document, yeah. your SQL, your SQL. I haven't SQL. used Postgres in a while. You really? They like just Postgres is awesome. Like, what did they do? Like, like JSON is, objects in there? Like, what, yep. That's basically yep. what they did. Because that's what it is, is essentially. Yep. Awesome. Exactly. But they have all sorts of other really cool file. I know. Fields that you can put in, like, yeah, there's geo. So, Mon have, like, Mongo has a geotype now, too, the geotyping. Um, but the, Postgres has it. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Is that going to Whatever eight? the most recent is. Can you do in like, can you, can you do um, aggregations, like MapReduce aggregations so like in Postgres? Um, I'm not sure whether that's okay. in this one or coming out in the next one. That's awesome. But that's they also I mean. can do like tree structures where you can, where you can do searches on within huge trees of data. Mm -hmm. Like tree paths. That's awesome. So, Postgres is really phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's I haven't I haven't used things. it in a while, but now that I know that it does no, I mean, it's going to blow like Mongo and PostgreSQL out of the water if it does that. For a lot of performance, they're, they're actually better than Mongo yeah. in some performance metrics. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think you had a link talking about Scikit pandas or something. Um, SK Learn and pandas. Yeah. yeah so. How is, is that something that's supposed to integrate Scikit-Learn and Pandas, and how is that progressing? Um, so it's progressing really well. I've only done it for um, random forest progression. Um, and yeah, you, like you literally just say, vectorize this array, make this my feature set. Um, uh, I did it for support vector machines. You can say, apply this kernel, apply this parameter, and run, and, and it'll, it'll iterate. Yeah, it's so like how, point how and click versus. How much of Scikit-Learn can you use if you have like a pandas data frame? Or? I've been able to use, I mean, I haven't, I can't say 100% because I haven't used it that much, but I've probably been able to use like 60% of it okay. of Scikit, yeah. Um, and that's kind of, yeah, I've, I've used most of the, I've tested out most of the algorithms at least. Yeah. 
support vector machines are the hardest ones. Um, I have problems with Mahout. Uh, they don't do them. Uh, with doing with Hadoop, Mahout doesn't do SPMs. So um, I, went, I went to Python and I was able to do it. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, let's thank our presenters. <laughs>